So my name is James Pennock. Um, I'm from, I work at Oath. Uh, Oath is a house of brands, um, many of which I think you're all familiar with. Yahoo, Huffington Post, AOL, um, quite a few more. And uh, we, we are passionate believers in building secure infrastructure. This is something that we're really trying to make part of our DNA. So I'm gonna to talk to you about zero trust. And so it's what, to start with, what is zero trust? So zero trust is a security concept where you do not implicitly trust anything that is within the boundaries of your infrastructure. Instead, everything and e anything and everything must be explicitly understood, permitted, and trusted. Uh, an example of uh, implicit trust, something that many of us see pretty much every single day, is SSH host key. You go to log into a machine for the first time and it says, hey, this machine has an identity. Do you trust it? What do you say? You say, oh, sure. We all do it, it's okay. Well, it's not okay, it's, but it's a, problem we need, it's a problem that can be solved, and it's one that we, I think working together we can all solve. And this is actually something that we have built a solution for, which I'll touch on a bit later. But this is a, more of a metaphor for how m many companies do business. We all do it. Um, so what do we do to control, to, to, what, what do most companies do when they need to control access to their, their resources? Security is important. I need to make sure that everything is attested and it's trusted. Um, and to make sure that I don't spew too much security ease, I'm going to define those. Asserting something, this is a term that we use a lot, asserting something is a strong statement. For example, my name is Jonathan Bryce and I'm the executive director of the OpenStack Foundation. This is an assertion I've made. So you can trust it, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Attesting it is the act of validating an assertion. I am Lauren Sell. You can say, show me your ID. Okay, I can't do that. So. Uh, why does this matter? So we, we want to protect all these different parts of our infrastructure, and so we, uh, without the right tools in place to do it, we do the best we can with, with the things we have. So one of those things is uh, network ACLs. Okay, so I, I, can't, I can't establish trusted application identity between two endpoints, so I'm gonna make sure that, you know, I'm just gonna uh, go to the firewall on my network. I'm gonna make sure that there's only a port is open between these two servers. Boom, there, solved it. Except now we have an implicit level of trust because if I have network access to this host, I am therefore assuming that that permission is allowed. Well, that honestly, it kind of works on small scale. But when you get to a large scale infrastructure, right, if you're one host, talk to one host, that's one thing. But what about when you have hundreds of hosts that need to talk to hundreds of machines over here and dozens of machines over here? You now have something much larger than an N squared problem, which means that the mechanisms you use to control these network ACLs start to fall apart. You start to have, uh, sometimes we call them ghost ACLs, we start to have these abandoned and orphaned terms in our firewalls that aren't supposed to be there, meaning sometimes someone could boot an instance and it now has a level of network access it was never meant to have. So we've created this, this process-heavy situation that is giving us this false sense of security, but it's not actually protecting us. Um, there's other issues too. For example, uh, firewall, physical firewalls, there is a limit to the number of firewall rules they can have, and I assure you, we, you can hit them. So you say, okay, now I'm, I'm not just gonna do that, I'm gonna add another layer on this onion. I'm gonna make sure that things talk to each other using a headless user, boom, solved it. Well, headless users must have some way of gaining an identity, right? So we're gonna take, an we're gonna take something that was designed to represent a human, and we're now gonna use that to represent a service. Okay, well, I need to have a password, which means I need to put the password somewhere. So now I've got 200 machines who all have access to the same password, so if that gets compromised, boom, done. And if you've ever, ever hired an intern, you will learn that passwords go into GIST, they go into GitHub, they get committed into code. These are things that happen. As, as soon as that happens, what do you do? You change your password on every single OpenStack cluster around the world, right there on the spot, breaking the surface. This is a personal scar. 
Another, another way of doing it is actually limited to the prior one is a shared app secret. So these can be, be a different form of application credentials. It can actually be something like a X509 certificate. There's a, a bunch of different ways, but it all comes down to the same problem, which is yet again, you're taking this thing and you're putting it somewhere and giving everything access to it. So that's not secure. And even then, <clears throat> when we talk, if I touch back on the network hackles for a second, you're like, no, 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 I've got this. My network, my firewall rules are perfect, liar. I have this all sorted out, nothing can go wrong. And then you learn about ARP spoofing. Something can definitely go wrong. Your IP address, in fact, uh, this is, I don't, know if it's probably, I don't know if it's happening here, but anyone from the US knows, your phone number means nothing anymore because I've gotten a call from my own damn number. What's that? Exactly. The phone number, it's, it's just a string of texts. I get, uh, I've been getting advertising calls from a number of numbers. Uh, the owners of those numbers do not know that their phone number is being used. Okay. Um, it's a metaphor. So that's good to know. We need to adopt that ourselves. Um, Okay, so you've got shared passwords, you've got uh, shared application credentials, you've got unnecessarily complex firewall rules that are actually creating more problems than they're solving. You've got this false sense of security. Ironically, all this comes with like a really, it inevitably comes with a heavy bureaucracy, which then tends to help reinforce the sense, this false sense of security. It's like, well, we go through a lot of hoops, so, so therefore it must be secure. So I'm now gonna make an assertion. Um, zero trust security is, really is a less is more thing because by having a situation where you can actually provide a secure, attestable identity, where you can provide a policy, uh, where you can actually provide all the things you need to allow your things to talk to each other, and we can provide those things ha on a self-service and a dynamic basis, which actually means that we can get rid of the, uh, the, the, some of the things we've done to our physical network, some of the policy and process we've put in place, we can do business faster, smarter, and it's more secure. So the three things I'll touch on as I go here uh, for zero trust are gonna be authentication, authorization, and micro-segmentation. Um, so authentication, authentication for humans is kind of a solved problem for the most part. Um, the, for, for web authentication, uh, you've got uh, different services. You've got like Okta, you've got LDAP, Active Directory, Kerberos. There's a lot of different things out there that one way or another with 2FA or not, you can use to authenticate a person. The same does not exist for services, which is the point I've kind of been building here. So how do we, how do we move forward? So, Athens is something we've built to give an identity to principles. And a principle can be either a service, an application, it could be a person, as well as role-based access control and policy to grant access to resources. So it allows, so it allows you to give something an identity and allows you to express what these things can do in relation to each other. Uh, we, we present this, this credential, uh, it's in a couple of forms, but the main form is it's an X509 certificate. Every service in your cloud has an X509 certificate, and for those not familiar, an X509 certificate, it's an SSL certificate that you use to run a web server. Every time you go to an SSL encrypted website, which is pretty much everything these days, they are presenting an SSL certificate, which is effectively, a, they have a private key, they have a public key, and they're presenting that public key to you that's been signed by another trusted party. In this case, a certificate authority whose public key is already on your laptop. And a certificate is effectively a public key and some metadata that's signed by that trusted authority. But it's not just for servers, they're also for clients. And when you combine the two, you have something called mutual TLS, which is I can say that you as the server will represent itself as its server, and I as the client will represent myself as a client. We can both attest each other's identities. 
This is similar uh, as, a, as a, again, a metaphor, two people walking up and showing their, li their passports to each other before they do something. This is who I am, that is who you are. These certificates are also short-lived because it doesn't do, very, doesn't do me a lot of good if I'm giving everything a certificate and that certificate's good for five years. Because now, if someone steals that certificate, now that it becomes a bearer document, they can go and impersonate you. <clears throat> uh, we have built a system, so uh, Athens, open source, and I'm gonna keep talking about Athens. We've built another system called Copper Argos, which is a, a testable identity bootstrap mechanism for OpenStack. And again, this is all pieces that we've open sourced. Um, some of the pieces we still have, I think there's a couple more pieces to open source, but we can talk about that more at the end. So this is a system, and I have another talk on this where I go into much greater depth. So uh, if you search for a testable instance identity from the previous summit from Vancouver 2018, you can see another talk that uh, Mujib and I gave on that. Um, so I'm gonna just gloss over it here, which is this is a mechanism that allows OpenStack to interact with Athens to procure and distribute a, an identity for your instances in a very secure way. The consequence of using this is that when your instance boots through OpenStack, it has its own SSL certificate, its own identity, which is automatically rotated every 24 hours and then it has a, a and also obviously automatically expires. So that was authentication. Who are you? Now authorization is what are you permitted to do? So to cover this, I want to talk about the Athens data model a little bit here. Athens has a concept of domains. And a domain is a, like a namespace container. And by the way, I know that there's a lot of overlap with Keystone here. It's unfortunate, it's just how it played out. Athens has a concept of domains. A domain is just a named thing. Um, that domain under which there will be, uh, there, a domain can have a number of services listed under it. So you have a principal, which is either a user or a service. You have a role, which is a list of principals. So a role is a list of users or a list of services or a mix of both. You then have policy, which asserts an action on a resource. What that means is the assertion is like grant or deny. The, uh, the action could be um, allow update to um, a website, you know, allow you to upload data, read-only versus admin. And the resource is an arbitrary string that you provide that your application interprets. So if I say that I'm going to allow Ian, I'm going to grant Ian admin access to, to my website on this element. Inside my website, when I, when I build it, I actually make sure to call out that, okay, if the user if the user has the, uh, this policy, then I'm gonna permit them to do this thing. I'm just, I, I'm just trying to be clear that the resource is like an arbitrary thing that you choose inside of your application. Um, there's a few different ways you can leverage something like Athens. So this is an example of a centralized model. So let's say that I want to grant a service Let's say that I have a configuration management service and I want to grant one of the entities in that service the right to change the max heap memory setting to eight gigs, however I've chosen to implement this. So I, as the admin, I communicate with Athens, I set that policy. Then whatever this configuration service is, when this node comes in and attempts to make that change, it actually will call Athens from there and say, hey, is this allowed to happen? It gets a copy of the policy back, it validates, yes, okay, this is something that's acceptable, move on with my life. The interesting thing here is when this client connects, it's doing so over SSL, but because it has an SSL certificate that shows its identity, and the server has an SSL certificate that shows its identity, there's a mutual TLS, there's a mutual trust, and I'm trying to think of how to express this. <clears throat> so there's this mutual trust exchange. Totally froze, sorry. 
I totally blanked. Mutual trust exchange. But what's interesting is that the ser uh, service manager is able to extract the, any additional policy information it needs from the client's SSL certificate. So I don't know, just know who you are. I know like, what roles you've been added to for this domain. It's then able to use that when it calls Athens to do a lookup. So that's the, that was the centralized model, where you're, every time something comes in, you're making a call to Athens. The advantage to that is uh, you don't have to wait on propagation delays. The disadvantage, of course, is now you have, uh, you know, you, you, you have the problem of you're, you're making an extra call whenever something's coming in. The decentralized model, this is where Athens policy can actually be distributed uh, to your nodes. So your domain admin grants John Doe access to something. So in this, in this model, I've got some secret management system. I could say it holds keys or something. So the domain admin says, you know what, I'm gonna grant John Doe access to secret X, and I'm done, I finished. John Doe then goes and makes a call to Athens and says, hey, I'd like my, my, I'd like my identity, please, which could be in the form of a token or it could actually also be, in, again, in the form of a client certificate. John Doe then calls that, calls this secret management system, whatever it is, which has since synchronized its copy of the policy he passes his token, it's able to look locally, validate that he, yes, that I see that this is a policy he's been granted. I see there's a policy that is granting him access to this thing. It's all good. It, it, and he's able to gain that secret. So the advantage here is you're not making any off-box calls, but the disadvantage, of course, is that there could be a slight propagation delay. The third model, which is something we're leveraging in our newest OpenStack environments, which is a federated use of Athens, so uh, if you, any of you have been paying attention to the Open Edge MVP stuff, this is actually the model uh, we are working with the Keystone team to help bring, uh, kind of bake natively into Keystone, the generalized concepts. In this model, we use Athens policy and to create a role that is delegated to another, do to another tenant, to another domain. That tenant, that role, you're allowed to manage your own users within that role. When you go and you get your token and you present that to OpenStack, we're able to actually validate. OpenStack is able to validate the, the, the token by checking the public key, because it has a copy of the Athens public key. So we can validate the contents of that token. We can then say, okay, I see that your user name is Jane. In fact, I can go from here. Admin as you, we see that Jane calls Athens, she gets her token, uh, which contains just her name, her domain, uh, the list of roles to which she's been granted, one of which is gonna be, uh, in this case, we, we actually bake the Keystone role in as well. She calls Keystone. Now you'll notice nowhere else on this screen is there the Athens service. She went, she got her token, she's done talking to, to Athens. She calls Keystone and she passes her token Keystone is able to validate, like, okay, I see that you have a signed token, it's from an entity that I trust. I know, I, so therefore I trust that your username is Jane, and I trust that your tenant name, she's passed the value OS project name is um, Foo. It says, okay, well I can see that yes, you've been granted access to this tenant. It then looks locally and says, does the user Jane exist? If not, create her account. Does the project exist? If not, create it. And does the Keystone Role Association for Jane and that project exist? And if not, it creates it. So the act of typing OpenStack server list means that Jane has automatically created her account, created her tenant, taking care of all of that. There's no propagation delays, there's no waiting, there's no like, external tooling needed. It's just you, you enter the line in policy, she gets her token, and she's off and running. So, I'm going to take a little bit of a, uh, of a step to the side here to kind of set up the next thing. So, you have all of your identity, you have your, your instances, they all have their unique identity, your user has an identity, you can use it to talk to OpenStack, you can boot your instances. Your instances come up, they all have identities, but how do, you, how do you understand, like, what is the grouping of all these instances? How do you say, I have a service, like Yahoo Mail, what are all the servers that comprise Yahoo Mail? So we have something called Service Mapper. 
You run an agent on your instances. That agent heartbeats using mutual TLS. So the act of connecting over mutual TLS causes it to identify itself. It sends its heartbeat, which includes a variety of metadata, like its, I, its IP address, its host name, things like that. And then it's done. By the way, the IP address and the host name, those are actually in the certificate. So this isn't even something that we just are trusting you for because we don't have implicit trust. It's, it's baked into that certificate. So we know that something has gone and validated that the information, that that host name and that IP address and that OpenStack EUID all belong together. And that's what it's passing up. Um, the, another interesting thing is that when you delete an instance, we don't tell Service Mapper. Um, if an instance goes away, and if a certain number of heartbeats are missed, we just remove it. That becomes interesting, more interesting in a second here. The, uh, the final thing I'll call out is that you can establish something we call a watch, which is you can either call Service Mapper and say, hey, give me a list of all instances which have this Athens service identity. You could also say, you know, give me a list of everything with this Athens service identity, but I'm establishing a watch, and it's sort of like a message queue. Every time a new instance appears, you get a message. Every time an instance goes away, you get a message, and you're able to update accordingly. Now, how is this relevant to zero trust? Microsegmentation. Microsegmentation is, well, I already defined it here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It's a security concept where you, you're applying the principle of least privileges, principle of least privilege to all resources on your network. So rather than say, and this is a very common pattern, is to say, okay, you know what, I've got all these different servers, I need to like take some load off my firewalls, I'm gonna say, Everything in this network backplane, I'm just gonna open port 80 from the world because that's, that's easier. Or I'm gonna say everything that's in this network backplane, I'm just gonna open the network, they can all talk to each other on any port. Um, and as we covered earlier, that's intrinsically insecure. Microsegmentation is saying no, we're not gonna do that. Every single host is gonna run its own host-based firewall. And it will, in addition to running Athens and having else in place, It'll run its own host-based firewall and only open the ports to other servers that are needed. This is where Service Mapper comes into play. Because now you, we have a policy enforcement service where you define a, you can define policy for a, a service. And you can say, I need to allow all of these, serv all these members of this service, they need to talk to all the members of this other service. So my front-end web servers, need to talk to my database nodes on 3306 or whatever the SSL port is. So rather than having to do a push to a firewall device, the act of the instance coming up and heart beating causes PEZ, our policy enforcement service, it sees like, oh, I see that a new thing has joined this service. It calculates the new rule set and pushes it out to all of the hosts in the front end and in the database. Um, these uh, firewalls are all implemented via IP tables on the host. Um, this is because neutron security groups are not something that we can, uh, this, we, our newest OpenStack environment, we're using IP, uh, neutron security groups, but that's a VM only thing. Our legacy, our older VM clusters, we're not using security groups yet, they're, they're all pretty old. And uh, our bare metal clusters, we're not using security groups because it doesn't do any good. <clears throat> So what's next? Well, what's next is Athens is out there, it's open source, uh, you can use it to provide an immutable instance identity to everything, you can use it to build trusted communication between all resources in your cloud. Um, this, uh, this is something that we, we're, we're continually in the process of baking into our DNA and making our infrastructure uh, better, faster, more resilient, and most importantly, more, more secure so we can continue to respect the trust that our users have placed in us. Uh, if you're interested in Athens, it's open source. I've got the website up here. There's a variety of resources. Uh, pull requests accepted. We'd be delighted if you wanted to use it and if you want to contribute things back. If you find anything wrong, open an issue. We'll take care of it. And uh, yeah, there's an upstream Slack channel. And uh, otherwise, if you have any other questions, um, please come up and ask them. Uh-oh.
That's an excellent question. So if you pass a role that is not defined in the Keystone backend, so for example, <clears throat> let's say that I'm going to, if I'm going to give someone access to, I don't want to give them the member role on a tenant, then I actually, the delegated role that I create inside of Athens is your tenant name, your project name, dot member. If I want to give you admin access, then I'm probably going to add you to the admin dot admin role. That one's a little bit of a weird case. But what if I put in admin dot foobar bass? Uh, in that case, what happens is if the, if the role doesn't exist, then there's an error. So we, we can create the user. I know there's a long walk for a short drink of water, sorry. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we create your user, we create the tenant, we go to create the role association, there is none. I think in that case you actually uh, would get, you would inherit the, I think you would in, uh, automatically get the member role is the way that, that works now in Keystone, at least in the version we're using. Um, yeah, but you, you don't get to be magically root. Sorry. Hi, just a quick question. So. Is the service mapper running within a container, VM, or the bare metal? Where is where's the dependency where the service mapper agent has to run in? That's actually a great question. So where is, uh, where is the service mapper agent running? So on bare metal, it's just running on the bare metal node. If it's a VM, you're just running out of your VM. If it's a container, you can actually either run it in the container or within a sidecar container. Uh, so then what are the requirements for it to run in the container? Because you said it uses IP tables to secure itself, then does it mean that I have to give it a lot of privileges to run within that container? So that's a great question. So um, the service mapper agent, uh, it sends, just sends a heartbeat. IP tables are actually managed by a separate agent. So service mapper agent, all it does is just sends out a little, it just chirps out home and says, hi, this is who I am. Rules get calculated and set down somewhere else. Now, we have not solved the problem of IP tables on our container bare metal hosts yet, so that is a great question. That's something the team is working on, which is for each container being able to actually create a local table for the container, uh, so that's work that's in progress. So one thing I'm wondering is, what does that do to uh, message payloads, because I, I from one of the earlier slides, I'm, I apologize if I didn't get the terms right, but uh, I seem to remember there was some um, authorization catalog or something like that that was being passed across. Um, and I seem to remember also in some of the recent Keystone iterations, you know, they were, they were very focused on reducing the size of these tokens because obviously that has a performance impact, right? Um, okay. I see. Um, so uh, I'll try to unpack that a little bit. Um, when we, so the tokens that, so there's the Athens token and then there's a Keystone token. And so you take your Athens, uh, you take your Athens identity and you use that to get a Keystone token. So I call Athens and I call the get tokens API. That causes it to automatically create my user, my project, my role association, whatever's needed. It then returns a Fernet token to me just for, just, it's just a normal Keystone Fernet token at that point. Future work for us actually does include investigating, uh, should we continue to return the Fernet token or should we just actually have it say, basically return you know, nothing? And then from there, you just pass your Athens token. If you call Nova, you just pass your Athens token to it and it would validate it locally using Keystone middleware. Uh, and in that context, we wouldn't need to use the Fernet tokens anymore. So I think if I followed right, um, the, you're, you're reducing some of the security threat that the beginning of your slides mentioned with shared secrets and um, passwords and things like that by creating these short-lived, very scoped uh, tokens, right? Yeah. Which I think uh, you refer to them as like principal tokens. What is, what is the bootstrapping process to get a principal token? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I feel like there's a chicken and egg type issue. That is, so let me see if I have that in. All right. Down here in the appendix. So um, just one thing, so a principal is, yeah, so you had a great question, like a principal is an attested identity 
uh, it's a thing. But so let's say that we want to boot a new instance. So to boot this instance, um, I'm even going to cover something that's not quite on here, which is I use the OpenStack command. I say OpenStack server create, uh, and I pass two metadata items. Uh, one is Athens domain and one is Athens service. When I run that OpenStack client, we've actually we've, we've added this to the client where it will run out to Athens, and using SSH CA integration, it will go and actually fetch your token, your Athens token for you, the user. So that's how we get you, that's how we attest you as the user is we use SSH CA. Um, we take that, we then call OpenStack with it. Now, when, it, when the server create, so you know, it does its usual validation of your call. So you call launch instance, um, what happens is OpenStack says, okay, I see that you have asked me to boot an instance and bootstrap it into this Athens domain in this service. It then actually makes a call to Athens and says, is this person allowed to boot an instance into this domain in this service? Athens says, yes, that's acceptable. What happens next is OpenStack talks to an intermediary service we have called, uh, called HostSignD, and it says, hi, I am gonna create an instance. It's gonna have this UUID, it needs to be for this Athens service and this Athens domain. Please give me a bootstrap document. This bootstrap document contains basically only that information, which is just OpenStack, the, the OpenStack UID, the, um, the, uh, the Athens domain, and the Athens service. That's, it has a TTL of about 30 minutes, is its expiry. That is then injected into the instance. When the instance boots, where am I at? Sorry, I started doing it on the top of my head instead of just following along on the numbers. Uh, so when the instance boots, it actually it, it has a, something called the service identity agent. We call it SIA. It's running on the host. That goes, it takes its bootstrap document and it goes to Athens uh, and it says, hey, I'm a brand new instance. I would, like, I would like my own X509 identity. What it does is it creates its own private key locally on the instance. It calls Athens, says, please give me a certificate. Here's my public key. Here's a CSR I've just created. Athens calls back to OpenStack and says, hey, I just got this UUID that just came out, out to me and asked me for an identity. It has a valid bootstrap document. Can you uh, attest these, uh, these assertions that were made in its request? Because it says it has this host name and these IP addresses. The reason that we don't put that, that information into the host document is because OpenStack doesn't know that yet when it goes to boot the instance. So this way the instance goes, it boots, it finds, figures out its own IPs, it calls Athens, says give me a certificate, here's my CSR, I've listed all my IPs in it. Athens validates all that information with OpenStack, says okay, this is all, this is all legitimate. It, it then mints the certificate, passes it back to the, the instance. So now the instance is up, Oh yeah, I glossed over. The certificate, when it's signed, it's signed by an HSM that's in like a Faraday cage and all this other cool cloak and dagger stuff. Um, it, has its, it has its certificate. But then probably your next question is like, okay, how long is the certificate good for and what do I do when it expires? So the certificates right now are actually uh, lo valid for longer than we'd like. And this is because we're trying to kind of build some trust in the system and get people familiar with it. But the nice thing about this is this is a knob we can turn down because they refresh their certificates every single night. We can change that to as frequent as we want. Um, and they're good for many days. And the reason for that is that if anything happens while we're, while we're still kind of expanding and turning the knob, we have time to address it without the, the infrastructure falling over. Because once you, if your certificate is expired, that's it, you're done. You need to go and rebootstrap with another manual process to kind of get that engine started again. But okay, what happens every night? So your instance every night, it's pretty much the same thing. Your instance creates a CSR. It still has the same private key, although we are gonna be adding a feature to, uh, to, to, read, to change private keys, because why not? Uh, so it will, be, it will be, but that's not happening right now. So every night it runs, it creates a new CSR. Um, you can also manually run this if you've gone and let's say you've added an IP to your Neutron port and you want, you, it's on your box and you wanna make sure that takes effect, not a problem. You just rerun SIA, it goes and fetches a new certificate. And everything happens from there. So it creates a CSR, calls Athens. This time it's using mutual, mutual TLS with its, with its current certificate, but it requests a new one, ZTS does a callback, generates a new certificate, or signs a new certificate, passes it back. It then also records the serial number of that certificate 
and says, and it, it keeps track of it for the validity period of the certificate so that no one else could come in and grab an old certificate and say, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go and request a rotation. Um, so that, that problem is also taken care of. Yeah, the, so the question was, uh, am I taking, effectively taking the user principal identity and through this process and through this chain of trust, granting an instance its own identity? Um, I think from one perspective, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's succinct, right? I have the right to declare that this thing should be granted an identity in this domain, and then I'm, and at that point I'm out of the loop. In the same way that someone at the US Passport Office has the right to say, okay, I've looked at his documents, I am going to stamp these. He now gets a passport. Now I have my own identity document. This, um, at least at a high level, seems to overlap with what Nova Join is supposed to do. Could this be implemented as sort of a, you know, Nova Join plugin? Do you know? Have you even looked at that? I honestly don't know. Someone said Nova Join to me yesterday, and it was the first I've heard of it, and I haven't had a chance to look it up. So uh, I, I have to admit, I don't know. So once you've done this bootstrap and the instance has an identity, um, do, do you typically limit the roles and permissions that that identity is granted? And then it uses its, like, let's say you allow those to live for a day, it uses that initial identity token to then request further more fine-grained permissions, and then those finer-grained permissions, you could have shorter TTLs, like five minutes. That's actually a really great question. So yeah, um, you have your identity, and then you can actually, in fact, you can use your identity, your authentication um, principle to request a role token or a role certificate, which is your authorization certificate, and that, that is a different TTL, and uh, you can also specify a shorter TTL. Now, I will note that it is not possible at this time that I'm aware of, maybe the team added it and I didn't know, um, to, to say like, oh, anything requesting a token from this role, like if I'm, like in my case, I have a, a domain that I'm delegating roles out of, I'm not able to say any, any token you grant from this role can only be valid for five minutes. But um, your question alone makes me think that would actually be a really good, that would be a really good feature, so. Micro-segmentation seems like obviously a very good idea, but it's fiendishly complex to program at distributed scale. Uh, are you addressing this problem? Or? Actually, yes, um, we are. So we have something called the Policy Enforcement Service where we can create policy and say, okay, uh, it actually uh, is similar to Roberts because it actually uses Athens policy or a, a mechanism similar to Athens policy where it, uh, we, you have, we have the ability to say, okay, I've got a workload group and the workload group is effectively whatever the, the list of servers, and that workload group is populated by Service Mapper. So that's how you get a list of all the host names and IP addresses. You then have a policy object which says, I'm going to allow this workload group to talk to this workload group on these ports and these protocols, so TCP 22, TCP 80, UDP 53, whatever. Um, so within, when, a, when membership changes in the workload group, we're able to, we then are able to take this policy and we have a system that goes and actually calculates the IP tables rules and distributes those rules out through uh, a, 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 a uh, sort of, I'm gonna use, I'll say the words configuration management system, though that could be misleading. Uh, we have a client server system specifically designed just to distribute and implement these rules. So the IP tables rule sets get pushed out all, to the, all the impacted hosts, they get a push, they pull down their new, they pull down their new rules, they apply them to IP tables. Um, as long as my memory isn't too rusty here, we actually, create, I think, write a new table and then we flip, uh, flip that table in so it's, a, so it's an atomic swap. Um, and then we keep the previous table in case anything went wrong, we can swap back. I'm not sure. I think actually I'm at time. Um, so yeah, sorry folks, I was paying attention. All right, thank you.